tonight, we have none other than our very, very first VIP on the show tonight. Our very, very own special guest from the wonderful world of wrestling. It is, of course, one half of the hooligans himself. It's Zach Knight. <laughs> How we doing, Zach? I'm doing good. A VIP. Listen, VIP. I've been called many things, but a VIP on your podcast, I'm privileged, man. That's it. I'll tell you what, mate, you are, honestly, because literally it's just me, Dale and Gav, and we're anything but VIPs, mate. You know what I mean? <laughs> we're, we're certainly a lot of P's, but I won't repeat that word during this podcast. So, um, so Zach, how are you, mate? How's things? Yeah, not too bad. Um, obviously, we're in lockdown three, which isn't pleasant for anyone. Um, and, you know, we're having to do our best to get through that, which I'm sure is a question that's going to come along during this podcast. <laughs> no, I don't, mate. It um, just makes for easy, easy interview fodder. There's a, pod, there's, a, there's a pandemic, mate. So, yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's and right. Term- yeah. Uh, yeah. We, we, you know, I'm the same as everyone at the moment. I'm just getting through. Fantastic, buddy. And in terms of the family that are all wrestling veterans and your own uh, immediate family as well, how is everybody coping all together? Uh, we're doing okay. It's a struggle because uh, obviously my dad is 68, uh, so he's yeah. shielding. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, the rest of the family's doing well. My sister is obviously still in the lockdown in LA at the moment. Uh, she has been since March. Uh, yeah. And for myself, my wife is now eight months pregnant. So we're actually wow. shielding ourselves as well. The only time we get out is to just get that hour exercise for the children or if I've got to do my, my workout just to stay fit. Fantastic. But well, congratulations. And uh, will this be, uh, if, if I'm right in saying, correct me if I'm wrong, will this be child number three? This will be child number three. Yes, it will Fantastic. indeed. And the last one, I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> they all say that, mate. You'll end up having your own five or football team before. <laughs> I'm telling you. Uh, it won't be happening to me, mate. I've, I've literally been down that road and had that appointment, so it ain't happening in our household anymore. I'm booking Two myself in on my 30th, which is May. <laughs> <laughs> best, best birthday present you'll ever have, mate. Trust me. Um, <laughs> So, Zach, obviously, uh, the wonderful world of wrestling. Um, we spoke many, many months ago. I think it might have been at the back end of maybe lockdown one, beginning of lockdown two. And, um, yeah, bit of background for those listening. Um, the reason why I got in touch with Zach was because of the fantastic documentary that you put together on, uh, on BBC, uh, which I believe is still available on the iPlayer. Is that right, Zach? It's correct, yeah. It's on there for the next, I believe, nine months now. It stays on BBC iPlayer for a year. Um, been very successful as well. I believe, you know, hundreds of thousands of downloads, which for a platform where you have to go on there and, uh, you know, type in what you're looking for, that's incredible. It's absolutely immense, mate. And it's absolute credit to, to you and everybody else behind the scenes putting that together. And also the ladies and gents who obviously partook in it as well. Zach, tell us about this documentary, because this is why I got in touch with you in the first place. Myself and uh, members past and present of the Pile Driver podcast have all got uh, either children or family members with additional needs. So just tell everybody who's listening um, about the, the documentary and what inspired you to put it together. I will do. Just to let you know, Dave, there's an internet uh, interruption here, um, but we'll, we'll crack on. We'll um, <laughs> professionals so basically what what happened was there's a gentleman called rob butler uh rob butler is a bbc radio norfolk presenter um and he's also uh the canary call presenter on bbc radio norfolk as well um rob is a longtime friend of my brother roy uh and he always wanted to get into the wrestling industry so rob come along and uh he's a man of all trades he's done commentary um he's been an mc but his true love is to be one of our officials um and bringing rob onto the team was a fantastic move he's a you know he's very he's a perfectionist he liked to do his job to the letter and he's a very good official one of our best actually um and rob watched fight with my family the movie and from that he comes straight to me and said look zach you know i believe that movie was fantastic it shows you in a good light but it wasn't you it was the actor it was jack loudon now we need to show people zach beavis you know, and I was like, OK, how are we going to do this? He said, I'm just going to film you. Do what you do day to day. And we're going to show people exactly what you do. I'm actually getting goosebumps because uh, the way he pitched it to me, you know, um, when people are looking at it through their eyes, you don't see what they see, if that makes yeah, sense. Very true. Yeah. You know, you're just doing your job. You're doing what you know how to do. Um, 
and Rob pitched it and the BBC took it immediately. So the back end of 2019, I had the camera crews with me for three months, uh, filming everything that we were doing. Um, and yeah, I never expected it to be as a massive hit ha as it was. Uh, and I'm really honored, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that so many people have been inspired by my friends and it, this family that we've created in WAW. Um, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Fantastic. And in terms of the, the type of people that you had on the documentary as well. So obviously you had all that to contend with. You had one of your friends come in, seeing your day-to-day -day routine through their eyes, believing that there was something in this that more and more people need to see on, on a specialist platform. How did it come from there to picking um, and working with and supporting um, young adults with additional needs and empowering them into the world of wrestling? So uh, obviously, you know, the documentary showed that James was the first person that come to me with a disability um, and he was blind, um, you know, and that in itself was a challenge. I didn't know how to act when my dad took the phone call originally saying that this young man wanted to become a professional wrestler. And my dad said, there's only one guy that can do this, you know, prior to this series, I've traveled around the country working with, you know, young adults and, you know, children that are, you know, in schools, but they're, they're under lock and key, you know, there's anger issues or there's, yeah. you know, there's, there's a past that these children can't move on from. And rightly so when you hear some of these stories, um, you know, and I was awarded certificates for working with these young children. And my dad said, look, my son, he's the man that you need. And um, I took that on and from James come Marcus and from Marcus come Sam and come Sam come pocket. And, you know, they all just kept coming. Uh, I've even had a 65 year old man come to me and ask me to make his dreams come true. And we succeeded. We give him a two year career in professional wrestling wow. um, before he comes to me and said, look, my body's had enough. I've lived the dream, uh, you know, but now he's, he's now gone into officiating. He's a referee. Um, but you know, what was shown on that series is what we do day in, day out, you know, um, and I've got a long list and a long email list that I've got to try and get through of people begging me to take them on. Um, you know, I've got my two nephews, RKJ and PJ Knight, that are now uh, under me. They're working as my assistant coaches um, and I'm teaching them everything that I know so they can carry on and we can expand the family, you know, bring more people in that have that dream. And uh, in society, they may be cast to one side and I hope people don't take offense to that, but they really do judge a book by its cover. Um, whereas we don't, we really don't. You know, if you've got a dream, let's get you in there and let's see if you've got the determination, the love and the passion to make that dream come true. And if you have, all we are is just that support bubble to help you and do it correctly and safely. Awesome. And you know what? When I was watching the every episode on that, <clears throat> and my wife was watching it as well. Now, my wife, God love it, she's not a big wrestling fan. Um, but in terms of because it was something personal to us, because we, you and I were speaking off air, um, yeah. I've got two sons, and uh, my oldest one, Alfie, he used to be an absolute wrestling nut um, when he was younger. He's 14 now, and he doesn't like many things in life, <laughs> um, certainly anything that, uh, that I like. Um, but my youngest son, uh, Joshua, uh, he has Down syndrome and autism. So it, it, it got to me on a, on a personal level as not just a wrestling fan, uh, not just watching somebody from the UK as opposed to it being an American or a Canadian or a Japanese wrestling show for a change. This was something UK based and it was working with people who, who my family just take for granted about being around. You know, children and adults with Down syndrome, with autism, and um, with ADHD, um, yeah. and you know, Asperger's, various degrees of autism as well. And to get a tune out of those people, it's it's no easy feat, Zach. And the way you and you and the team put that together, and as well as what you guys did, the way that the crowd embraced those people at the shows yeah. as well was just absolutely immense on every single level. It was immense emotionally, but you, you, you try and put yourself as a viewer, I did when I was watching the documentary, through the eyes of Rocket, of James, of Sam, and everybody else in there, and what it means to them, because very rarely, if ever, like you say, people with additional needs never seem to be on a 
on a seen on a positive platform. It's very, very right. rare that it happens. So for something like that was absolutely immense. What challenges and also what were the most hilarious parts of working with these individuals day in, day out? Because I know all too well. I mean, I used to work in schools a lot and I've worked in schools with uh, children with behavioral difficulties as well as additional needs as well. Um, and honestly, no two days were ever the same. What was it like for you coming from a, a full on wrestling pedigree, working with young adults with additional needs? What were the most difficult things, but yet what were the most hilarious things that you saw and got up to? Well, the first challenge you've got is gaining trust. Um, you know, these all individuals need to be able to trust in me and believe that I can make them a professional wrestler. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's out of the ring. Sometimes that's just going for a walk, listening to what their day's been. Uh, you know, what have you been doing today? Or if having a bad day, being that shoulder, they're there going, it's okay. You know, we all have bad days, but guess what? We're all fortunate enough to have a second chance and that's called tomorrow. You know, let's forget about today, get on with tomorrow and see if we can make that more positive. Um, you know, having mental health issues myself and really having to dig deep to get out of a black hole, I'm now a very positive person. You know, there's not a lot that will bring me down. And if it does, I'm the sort of person that after a couple of days, I pick myself back up and I've got a really good support bubble around me. My wife being the absolute best. She really do understand me. And uh, I believe that a lot of my training methods had stemmed from the way that my wife treats me. You know, when I'm having a bad day, she knows what to do, what to say, how to comfort. And it sounds strange, but she does. And no individual are the same. And there's different ways and methods of training people. Some need hard love, like pocket. She needs me sometimes to say, come on, let's get up, let's get on with it. You know, she kind of needs that tough love and that sort of give her that, that, you know, that rocket that she needs to go, all right then, let's do it. Um, then you've got someone like Sam who needs an arm around him and say, okay, buddy, this may be hard, but if we accomplish this, you're going to feel really good. Then butterflies are going to be there. You're going to feel the best that you've felt. Then you've got someone like Marcus that you have to really break it down. You know, you have to find many methods and ways to explain it to him until the light bulb goes and he goes, got it. And yeah. when that light bulb goes, man, are the, is he incredible? You know, when we find the Marvel method, which was what we call it for him, um, it is sussed. Now, this boy has gone from... Uh, you know, being a vulnerable adult with a lot of anger issues to now be in the current WAW light world heavyweight champion and Amazing. wrestling in the main event against people like RKJ who were tipped for the top leagues within the next three years and he held his own. Um, you know, so the toughest part is getting to know him, getting to trust you. The funniest parts is, you know, I, I believe the most funniest parts are the most rewarding parts. When you see them accomplish it and they're like, wow it's like christmas day yeah. you know and they're on cloud nine and that's when i wish i could bottle it up and keep it for my dark days yeah. you know a lot of people don't understand that these guys are actually my medication they help me um you know but you know watching james try and go through the ropes and fallen over and landed on a padded mat outside that's hilarious watch him trying to climb up the ropes and slip obviously it's safe we look after him but that's hilarious and all of them all of them now when something's not going right, they laugh it off. And that's the mentality we installed very quickly. Fantastic. And all, are all these guys still uh, obviously with uh, World Association of Wrestling as well? Are they all still, part, well, obviously, pandemic aside, up until the point where we went to lockdown, were these guys still on the books, still coming to training, still coming to coaching and things like that? Yeah, so all of them are still on the books. Some of them will train in the large group because we do two weekends a month with a large group of, you know, up to 50 people in a weekend sometimes. Others, they still need that one-on-one -on -one attention. Um, but obviously for people like Sam, um, he is having to shield and rightly so. Um, he's not been able to perform for a good while now. Um, and, you know, me and his parents, we get on really well. Matt and Jane are superb people, um, you know, and we just work together. Once he's had the vaccination, once we start getting back to normality, he's there and ready. And we've got, you know, three, four, five hundred people waiting to sell out the WAW arena to watch that boy go for a second time. Fantastic. That's going to be absolutely immense. I think one of the most touching things I saw on there uh, was it uh, James's uh, big dream of being able to do the frog splash. Yes. Just to be able to climb up 
and for a, a, a guy who's obviously visually impaired, I yeah. mean, for any of us, I mean, you you know far more than what I ever will, but to be able to stand up on there anyway, it must be quite daunting for your first time of doing it. To be it able is. to do that with no vision is just absolutely incredible, isn't it? It's absolutely well, I have I have people that ain't visually impaired that can't stand on the top rope. You know, they may have balance problem. They may have a burst eardrum or something as a child that's preventing yeah. them from standing up. You know, obviously balance is a big part of it. Um, and what people don't know is for balance, you use a lot of your sight, you know, because you'll fixate on something, which is then what calms there. And then you can stand up. Now for James, I I've got to be honest. James is an absolute legend. That, that man, if I say, okay, we're going to try and do a toe pay through the rope today. There's 15 people waiting outside the ring. I want you to run. When I bang that canvas, I want you to Superman pose and jump it up in a rope. His answer is, okay. Brilliant. It's really that simple when it comes to James. Uh, was it difficult? Yes. Because we had to learn how many steps it was across the ring. We had to learn the sequences. You know, it was all memorized and making sure that there was a secret code, whether it be a click of a finger to duck the elbow or a stamp of a foot to slide through the legs. But predominantly speaking, you know, once he had it and once he knew uh, the routine, it's like a dance for James, not not a uh, wrestling show. Yeah. You know, everything is like a dance, a routine. And, you know, obviously, we I do make sure that James practices matches well in advance because, you know, his safety is key here. And not just his safety, but the person he's against. You know, I need to make sure that if James is lifting one of my wrestlers, they're not being dropped on their heads, et cetera. So True. for James, the build up for his matches are a longer process. Um, but my God, that that boy, that man, I should say, is incredible. And what an inspiration. The full the full documentary was absolutely incredible. Um, are there any more plans to do any more episodes in the future? Or is it just going to be like a, a one shot of the four episodes and that's just going to be the way it's going to be? Or do you think there'll be something else to come from that, Zach? So as I said, my friend was one of the producers, the guy that pitched it. Um, you know, we stay in contact a lot and we talk about a lot of stuff. Now, we do speak and I am trying to plant seeds in his head for him to go and take it back. But while we're in a pandemic and a lockdown of stuff, I, you know, there's no plans to do a second series. However, you know, the numbers don't lie. And the way that this was taken nationwide, because, it, you know, it went nationwide in the end, Um I think it'd be silly not to do a second series. Um, I'd love for the second series for me to be able to take these guys out to America and maybe train under someone else and see if they can make it that way. Um, you know, but at the minute there's no plans, but I would really hope and I'd like not just for me, but for the other guys to get that limelight for the attention to be on them, not for the wrestling, but purely for the inspiration of these guys. I hope there's a second series. That would be absolutely fantastic, mate, honestly, and it really, really would. So for everybody who's listening, uh, that's Step Into The Ring, and you can download that uh, or stream it on the BBC iPlayer. Honestly, not just a wrestling fan, not just somebody who's obviously speaking to Zach this evening, but I cannot recommend it enough. And uh, I'll tell you what, even if you've got a swinging brick for a heart, you're going to be shedding tears during it through laughter <laughs> and through the most touching moments. In terms of then, Zach, let's bring it back down to you and you as a performer. What does the future hold for the hooligans and the future of World Association of Wrestling? Pandemic permitting, what are the plans going forward? So to be honest with you, the third lockdown, the first and the third lockdown really hit us hard. Um, but me and my family, we're the type of people that, you know, there's always a way. And we did find that way. We moved into a new premises, which was a lot larger, where we could have our own audience in there, up to 70 people, which was 25 or about 20 percent of the capacity we could actually get in there. Uh, we were running weekly shows. We were not making money. We weren't even breaking even. But we were still helping people that had these mental health issues and, and other underlying illnesses where they needed us and we needed them. Um, you know, we were trying to bring some normality to fans. Now, for WAW, I have very high hopes. As soon as we're out of this pandemic, we've got a building that can cater for 500 people that, you know, we run weekly, uh, sorry, monthly kids show, monthly women shows, monthly academy shows, monthly elite shows, and then with the final pay-per-view where it all amalgamates together so that you see the very best of all divisions on our pay-per-view. Um, 
we were just about ticking over and people started hearing about the, the WAW Performance Center, not just in Norwich, the UK, but worldwide. We are now getting emails from everywhere around the world asking us to help them achieve their dream. Um, so for WAW, I hold very high hopes that, you know, as soon as we're out of here, 12 months, we're going to be kicking. We're going to be really flying the flag for British wrestling and European wrestling. Um, for the hooligans, you know, we we want to get back on the road. We want to travel. We want to aim for them big leagues, you know, but I've also said to my brother that I still am 10 years younger than my bro and still aspire to get to the big leagues. Now, you know, that's not completely written off for me yet. You know, no, I'm not in any sort of conversations with him, but I have worked very hard on creating the Zach Zodiac brand. I, I train extremely hard to try and make sure I'm fit and ready for any occasion. Like I said, tomorrow's a new day. You don't know what tomorrow is going to present itself. So I like to make sure I'm ready um, because there's a lot of companies now. We're not just talking WWE. You've got AEW, you've got Ring of Honor, NWA, Impact. This is a fantastic time to be a wrestling fan. And it's a fantastic time to be an independent wrestler. So, uh, you know, for me, the sky's the limit. I'm still working hard. Uh, but right now, the goal is to get me and my brother back on the road and see how far that we can go. And if something upsets that, me and my brother already had that conversation. He was a massive part in my training. He was a massive part in the etiquette of, of teaching me on the road, uh, you know, looking after myself, you know, at developing promo skills. Um, I was always the forefront of working with the promoters. My brother said to me, no, get to the front of the line. This is the money that we want. These, this is the uh, fuel, you know, no, we're not taking less. Yes, we are selling merch. He was the guy behind me, educating me on how I need to present myself. And he has said to me, you know, bro, if the chance arise for you to go to the big leagues, do not think twice about me. We've had 10 years as a tag team. I love you. And if you make it, I've made it. So the hooligans will forever be strong. And that is the fact that right now, but if there's a chance for me to move up the leagues, my brother's given me his blessing. And obviously, as a 30-year-old man with now three children to think about, <laughs> I I'm going to take any opportunity. Absolutely, that mate. It, it's it's all about the Charles Dickens at the end of the day, what you can bring home and provide for the family, isn't it? So it's, exactly. uh, it's a big thing. Just on that, then, you've mentioned, obviously, uh, nearly all the mainstream uh, wrestling organisations that we're all now privy to. Uh, today, in between moments uh, at work, I was catching up on AEW um, today. and you know, AEW Dark and AEW Dynamite, which for me, uh, as a wrestling fan, it's, for me, it's taken over. I think at the moment, that is the wrestling promotion to, to look at. And the way that they've dealt with things in the pandemic as well has been absolutely incredible. And, and just, just the immense talent. And now, obviously, there's rumours that New Japan... Uh, are obviously going to be signing an American deal. There's potential, there's rumours now that not only are just our impact and AEW working together, but now we're potentially going to have New Japan in that as well. And uh, obviously Kenta uh, attacking um, John Moxley as well on uh, Dynamite at the end, yep. um, giving this the smug cleaner, Kenny Omega, um, a little bit of a cheesy grin at the end there. If you were given a choice, and I, if I'm putting you on the spot, tell me, Dave, I'm not going to answer that. But if you was to go for, if you could look at just the way things are now as a fan, just looking at it from a fan, not just a performer's perspective, but as a fan, if you were given the choice now to turn up in a ring and go on any promotion at the moment, just based on the current hype, which one would it be for you and why? That's a great question. And, um, you know, I'm going to give you an answer that you're going to be like, hang on a minute, Zach, you've not really answered the question. Um <laughs> There's two reasons, and the reason I'm going to say this is because I think for to show off my wrestling skill, to show off, because I, I, I class myself as an all-rounder. You need a tech guy, I'm your guy. You need a flyer, I'm a heavyweight flyer. You need a brawler, I will hit as hard as the next guy. Um, so I feel for that reason, AEW would really suit me because I believe that I could really showcase, you know, my all-round ability. But I believe as someone that can present the acting skills, someone that can carry a storyline and someone that can really, you know, deeply emotionally involve an audience. I believe WWE may be better for me. Uh, and the reason for that is I've got a lot of acting background. You know, I, I've been in a, f a couple of movies, um, you know, so for me, I would really 
I would really like to be able to capture an audience emotionally. And I believe there's more storyline that are pulling the heartstrings in WWE. When you look at Edge turning up at uh, NXT, you know, that whole promo of him looking at the belt, looking at the guys, you know, you just felt that presence, that emotion. It's kind of like, uh, look, I may come and do what Jericho's done in AEW right here. You yeah. know, and I felt that aura. Or when you look at uh, Drew McIntyre and a Sheamus, that real life scenario, how they're friends for 20 odd years. And that promo, you could see in the eyes of Drew, it's like, listen, bro, you want all this to end over a championship? Well, if that's what you want, this is what you got. I believe that I can really present myself and get into these storylines. Um, yeah. But going back to the originality of the question, as a professional wrestler, which is what I what I am deemed as, I believe I would probably showcased pr uh, to the best of my ability, probably in AEW, uh, just because I know I would get to work all caliber of workers, all shapes and sizes, and that's where people will see the real skill of Zach Zodiac, Zach Knight. Fantastic. Do you know what? In all honesty, Zach, I think we'd be happy to see you on, on any of those. I mean, you know, <clears throat> if anybody who's even lived under a rock has, has been well aware that when we speak about your family, obviously we know the success uh, that, that your sister's had under Paige, um, obviously being the, the youngest women's champion and and the success the success that's come from that as well. And 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 how quickly her career was was kind of narrowed down and cut short through injury as well but yet yeah. she's still managing to still get you know she's still having a part to play in wwe and i think it's so important as a wrestling fan that we have people from all different countries you know it doesn't just become an american and a canadian thing we need to have that british um wrestlers out there making a name for themselves and i think one of the good things you touched on about nxt there is obviously the nxt uk as well yeah uh, which is allowing stars such as Pete Dunne to be able yeah. to get on. And he has really taken that. And it's such a, I love watching him. You know, he's such a quality wrestler. I mean, my experience of UK wrestling was when I was growing up was the likes of Big Daddy, Giant Haystacks, Kendo Nagasaki, you know, yeah. the world of sports on ITV. To see how British wrestlers have evolved over the past 30, 40 years, has just been absolutely incredible to watch. Dream match. So somebody can give you now wrestlers past and present one on one dream match headlining 80,000 people watching you. Who would Zach Knight love to go toe to toe with? See, that, that's a difficult question. I get asked this a lot. Now, there's, you know, if you put aside the family who have obviously been very, very impactful on my career and very helpful. Um, I was always the American guy. Roy was brought up on British and loved it, but I was always glued to the, you know, razzmatazz, the lights, camera action, the product, the fireworks, pyro. Man, that, that's what I wanted. Um, so I have to always revert back to the top five in my book. Now, when I look at professional wrestlers, and I'm not looking at entertainers or showmen, I'm looking at all-round workers. My top three are Shawn Michaels, Eddie Guerrero, and Kurt Angle. I believe yes. them three are, uh, you know, just one of a kind. Well, three and one. Um, yeah. But then you look at the entertainment side of Hulk Hogan and The Rock. These five are the kind of people that I base myself on. You know, I like to be able to present myself as an entertainer and hold the audience like The Rock and Hogan. But I like to be able to go uh, and entertain the fans like the three guys I mentioned before. And I also want to be you know, like an, uh, an angle or a Guerrero where you're the general in the locker room where people are like, they've got my respect, you know? Um, so for me, if any of them five were to step up and say, right, it's, you know, me, me and Zach in the main event, I'd be blown away. I would absolutely be blown away. Epic. I'm glad you mentioned Kurt Angle. I went to uh, uh, an insurrection show in, uh, in London uh, many, 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 many years ago. And uh, I was privileged to see uh, Kurt Angle, like literally just feet away from, from Kurt Angle. And it was, um, it was, <clears throat> there was no storyline to it. It was just an exhibition match, a two out of three falls with another wrestler. Yeah. And it was just craft. There was nothing to it. There was no, there was no grabbing the mic. There was no sort of heel diss or face or crowd popping and things like that. It was literally one-on-one, -on -one, two out of three falls. He sat there and you could hear a pin drop because it was actually a moment during that pay-per-view where 
these guys are actually serious about what they do. These are genuine. These have actually, yeah. these, these guys love the craft that they do. So for you to mention Kurt Angle in there as a wrestling fan, being that close He's to seeing phenomenal. him. When yeah. I think of Kurt Angle, you know, every person that does an interview on the network or anything like that, Kurt Angle is always mentioned. And that's because he was a workhorse. He was a guy that would push you to be better than you was yesterday. You know, and that's how I pride myself. When I'm working the talent that WAW, you know, brings in or other guys that we're bringing in to work on the show, I want to be the guy that people go, I want to work Zach. You yeah. know, I want to work Zach because he's going to bring the best out of me. He's going to push me to be the best. And, you know, no two matches are the same with me. I don't want to go in there and do the same match I've done with the last guy the week later. You know, I always want to change it up. I always want to keep it fresh. I always want people to just be like, my God, does this guy ever stop, you know, coming up with something new? Yeah. You know, so, um, and that's where Angle and Guerrero and Michaels, they really did shine to me as a child. You know, I, I grew up and I was just like, man, I want to be like these with the charisma of, Hogan or The Rock or Stone Cold or, yeah. you know, someone that just had that that aura, that presence. Um, and I'm very lucky because I've had 30 years and I say 30 years because I recently found out that my mum actually wrestled when I was in her tummy. Um, so just like <laughs> Paige, uh, I was wrestling in my mum's womb. Um, wow. I've had a lot of time to learn this profession. And it's not just the in-ring craft. It's being a promoter, a trainer, an agent, an MC, a referee, a water boy, a plant in the crowd, you know, uh, a, a ring crew. Man, there's no aspect of this business that I've not learned. And the best part is with professional wrestling is every day is still a school day. And that's what I love about this business so much. Fantastic. And were you just saying that there, what you just said towards the end of that? To literally make it in this business, you've you've got to you've got to almost say yes to every opportunity, aren't you? Like you say, whether you whether some people it's, think, believe it's the most meaningless tasks of of setting up a, a show to everything in between there and stepping up into the ring and getting the crowd on side or getting the heat off the crowd as well. It sounds like to me that you know your mum and dad have, have, have brought you guys up to say you've got to be prepared to do everything and anything. To, well, the thing is, you won't, you won't go craft. to a, a painting job and not check that you've got the right tools. You know, you won't go and do an electrician job and not check your tools. The ring is our tool. And I want to make sure that ring's safe. So even today, you know, any of my guys will tell you, all right, I may not lift as much as I once did. I, I've kind of got the rights to say, no, I ain't lifting it. But I will play a manager here and make sure this is going up properly. Before the show, I'll always get in the ring, check the ropes, check the pads, make sure there's no holes in the mats. You know, that is my tool. That is how I'm going to be able to perform at the highest level. Now, if them ropes are slack, I need to drop the, the move set that involve the ropes, any sequences, any high risk maneuvers yeah. and concentrate on mat wrestling. Uh, you know, so I, it, in order to be the best, you need to know everything about what you're trying to do. You yeah. know, so for me, I wanted to learn every aspect of this job, every single aspect. And, you know, all right. In 10 years time, my body might not be able to keep up because I've started at such a young age, my body didn't develop properly. But I still want to be involved in one way or another, whether it's a producer, whether that's a trainer, whether that's a promoter running the show, you know, and that's why I was very keen to learn every aspect of this business. And anyone that is listening to this, watching this, they need to realize that wrestling's about a pie chart, you know, and you need to fill every part of that pie chart in order to be able to stand away from everyone else. You know, if you... I may be six foot three and 18 stone, but, you know, there's American football players out there that are seven foot, you know, 400 pound that can do backflips if they're taught long enough. Yeah. So yeah. I need to be an individual that's different that can bring something to a product. And my my way of doing that was learning every aspect of this business. Absolutely. You know, such wise words. And I'm really glad you've gone into that much detail about it because I think from a fan's perspective, I think we get lost. It's all about you have to look after yourself. Or it just, just seems... On the surface level, you've got to look after yourself, keep fit, train, and eventually you'll just get your right opportunity. That's and the tip of the iceberg, mate. It's a tip That's of the, the iceberg, tip of the isn't iceberg. it? Absolutely, buddy. A question from Dale uh, has just come in as well, who's uh, one of our members of the podcast. Um, the film Fighting With My Family, uh, was the film a fair representation of yourself and your family? And, um, and sort of you know, how did uh, how did the family sort of view themselves and you yourself in that movie, the way you were all portrayed? 
Yeah, you know, the film was pretty accurate. You know, obviously, as soon as Rock come in, Hollywood come in. Let, let, that's all people's got to remember. You know, um, if people were savvy, they'd realize the times didn't match up. We would try out in 2012, The Rock had long gone. So people need to, you know, kind of look at that themselves. Where The Rock was, Hollywood was. Uh, yeah. the, the, the real key to that was The Rock did actually uh, pull my sister in and tell her that she was going over for the championship and she was moving up. The Rock did find the documentary when he was here, filming Fast and Furious 6. He watched the documentary, fell in love with it, needed to make that, that uh, movie. Um, you know, there's parts that have been elaborated uh, in the story, but the story itself is true. The pub fight was true, but I wasn't alone, and I did not start that fight. You know, one of the girls that was with us in the group got hit with a pool cue. Uh, and, you know, we had a group of men come out to us, um, which is why that happened. Uh, and like I said, I was not on my own. I had a lot of backup with my brother being one of them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's parts of that. My sister, when she was contracted, obviously she weren't allowed to fly back. WWE is not going to release one of their talent to fly back and wrestle an independent wrestler. You yeah. know, but I mean... Yes, I would say 70% of that was very accurate. The way that they showcased us, was I bitter? I was more bitter than I was jealous because the bitterness crept in because I wanted to be the guy to go out there, set the house up and be ready for when my sister come. I wanted yeah. to play big brother in life, you know, all the way through. I, I didn't want her to be on her own, you know, and the phone calls of her crying down the phone. I might give up. I might come home. That's stuck. I'm going, don't you dare. Don't you dare give up. You know, you've achieved that dream. There's people out here that are dying for that opportunity. Don't give up now. Yeah. You know, so, yeah, there was a part of me that was bitter, but I was never, ever, ever against her. I was always on the end of the phone. I was always rooting for her. I was always, you know, making sure that she was okay. And I never stopped fighting to try and get out there with her. It's just obviously timing. It wasn't yeah. right then, but who's to say it's not right now? And who's to say that if I ever did make it, that my sister could met mentor me as a valet, manageress, Miss Elizabeth style, uh, coming out and helping me learn the ropes of WWE like I helped her learn the ropes of British wrestling and wrestling in general. That would be absolutely nothing short of amazing because ever since, obviously, you'll know, we, we had the, the, the British Bulldogs and then, obviously, Davy Boy Smith went out on his own. And for us as sort of, you know, just starting out in secondary school, just being able to come back to your mates after watching pay-per-views. Like, there was a British guy there went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Shawn Michaels and almost won the Royal Rumble. You know what right. I mean? There's there's the British guy there who's got the, you know, fighting for the intercontinental belt and things like that. And and then, you know, it, and it just goes on and on. All these epic matches with the likes of Bret Hart, Stone Cold, Triple yeah. H, et cetera, et cetera. To have another British dynasty in a major platform like WWE, AEW, NWA would be nothing short of immense. And I think one of the things I learned, sort of watching that film, I did watch it again and I thought, I am going to ask Zach about some of the genuine parts of it. Even when I watched the rock bit, I thought, ah, that was that was years ago. But you've got to, you, you know, we're not naive enough to think that every film that gets made that's a true story is going to be 100% accurate. We know that. And we know that certain parts are going to be dramatised. But how did it feel? Because not many of us are ever going to be able to ask ourselves these questions. Zach. How did it feel having somebody portray you in a movie? <laughs> um, to be honest with you, um, this is going to be a long-winded answer. Um, but let's start by saying I first watched that movie in October 2017. And... Um, Two months prior to that, I had my nervous breakdown and my God, I was as low as a snake's belly and mental health really came into effect. Um, and I just kept saying to people, what is my purpose? What am I doing here? What is the point? I know I've got my children and I love them to bits. I always will and I will always be their rock. But I needed a purpose to what I'm trying to do in life. You know, I, I, I'm the sort of person that I believe I've been put here for a reason. And uh, watching that movie for the first time was like an out-of-body experience. Watching Jack Loudon play me was the first time, like I revert back to earlier about the whole Rob Butler thing, I was yeah. able to see with my eyes what I do. And watching that was a, a new lease of life. It was like, okay, this is your purpose. You don't need the, the lights, camera, action, the fame, the fortune, the acknowledgement. 
You just need to keep doing what you're doing because your reward is making pe people's dreams come true. You're not the star, you're the star maker. And as soon as I come to terms with that, my life's been set. You know, I know my purpose. I know what my goal is in life. So that movie, watching that back, actually really helped me and impacted my life so much. Um, and Jack Loudon uh, is a credit, absolute credit. He mastered it. And, you know, he'd send me a voice note. Zach, how would you say this? Bear in mind he's Scottish, you know. Right, right yeah, Zachy, yeah, how yeah. would you say this? And I'd be like, right, you know, you, you know, I'd say, drop the H. You got to drop the H. You know, we're we're Norfolk. You know, let's, you got to have it, son, have it. You know, uh, have it. That's right, Jack. Um, the boy worked tirelessly. He put on about three stone. Trained really hard. Up at five in the morning training. Uh, he committed really. And every single actor, actress, anyone that was involved in that movie, our family really did give him, you know, all of our blessings and was so proud of every single one of them. Fantastic. Yeah, like I say, don't, you, you, you practically answered one of my other questions was, did Jack lean on you then in terms of how would you act? How would you behave? Obviously, you've mentioned about the accent. Did he keep in touch with you quite often? Did he mention about what sort of training regimes that you might go through to get the figure, to put the weight on, to, to be able to do things like that? Well, to be fair, the, the, the crew really looked after Jack. They got him a personal trainer. Um, they helped him put the weight on. You know, it may have been low budget, but they used it wisely. Um, you know, they hired us to take our rings down there. We met the crew from the get-go. We had say on what we wanted in the movie. You know, we were big on making sure that Norwich was in it because we wanted that heavily featured. We're very proud of our roots. Um, so to be honest with you, Jack would talk to me a little bit about how he's portraying me, but he really studied that documentary. That's where Jack learned a lot about me was the original documentary that was on Channel 4. He studied that, um, you know, really understood who I was. Um, but for me, the best part of that whole movie was when Jack was on the phone in the side of the car talking to uh, Morgan uh, and basically saying, I need this. He really captured the emotion so much yeah. so that even to this day, whenever I watch that movie, I still get the lump in my throat. I still, because it, although I didn't speak to a WWE rep, I spoke to Drew McDonald, who was my agent. And I was this close, literally the skin of my teeth. People were shaking my hand at the uh, at the building, telling me you're signed. You know, I had wow. all wrestlers. I'm not going to name drop, but all wrestlers yeah. shaking my hand. You've made it. Welcome to the team. And then it was taken away. No, not this time. Uh, and that's when I said to Drew, Drew, please, please, this this I give everything this time. I've got no more in the tank. I need I need this to be happen. And it, I'm sorry, kid. They're not going to take you. You know, and that was in 2011. I met my wife in 2012. And, you know, all right, that was fantastic. Meeting the love of my life, my best friend, my soulmate. But as soon as my son come in, the reality sunk in of, well, how the hell am I going to provide for my family? I've dedicated yeah. a life to wrestling. I have no income. I've got no job. I flopped school. You know, I've got no GCSEs, no qualifications to fall back on. That's where the depression set in. The weight, you know, I went all the way up to 21 stone. Um you know, and it was a hell of a ride. Um, but coming out of it, you know, was fantastic. And, and you know, Jack, full credit to him. Uh, even to this day, he'll still drop me a message every every few months. Hope you're okay. And that's all that needs to be done. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And that's just amazing. I'm, I'm so glad that you guys got quite a lot of autonomy in terms of what was put in the film and stuff like that as well, because you hear all these stories that years down the line that this wasn't accurate and we didn't get a say and they did this behind our back. So it sounds like you guys were pretty hands-on with that. Um, Dave, one of the funniest parts, I've got to quickly tell you, that, is right. when Stephen Merchant come down to meet us, right? He come in with a notepad and a pen and he came to my house and uh, my dad went, all right, Stephen, uh, Chinese tonight, is it? Right, yeah, uh, all right, well, uh, listen, your crew could pay for the Chinese, right? But daddy, he's a right top me. He loves it, you know? So, oh, right, boy, class. you guys pay for the Chinese. And Stephen went, uh, here, Ricky, I'll start with you. Um, tell me about yourself, you know? <laughs> how, how did you start in, in life? Uh, you know, uh, from the age of 18, tell me, you know, what happened? My dad went, uh, well, you know, from the age of 18, I spent uh, eight years in prison, you know, mainly <laughs> violence, mainly violence. My mum sat on his lap and went, yeah, mainly violence. You know, we had guns, everything. Uh, and Stephen Merchant's going, 
Oh, like class. We watched the movie back, and word for word, Nick Frost said what my dad said. Yeah, I was going to say, that's in the film, isn't it? That bit word as well. Word for word. Yeah. Word for word. That Everything that we said to Stephen, he managed to put in the dialogue somehow, word for word. That is mint. I bet you guys are rolling around watching that bit, weren't you? Oh, it was fantastic. You know, uh, my dad's actually got a T-shirt out now saying, uh, Ricky Knight, he's got his Pinky Blinders hat on, where he's just sat there looking like, you know, a 60s gangster, and it just says, (laughs) mainly violence. You know? Oh, that is quality. It's been taking that well that even Mick Foley, when he came over, went, uh, Rick, I need that T-shirt. I need it. (laughs) You see, now, when Mick Foley asks for your T-shirt, do you know what I mean? You know you've got something you merchandise-wise. You know you've yeah. got merch there, don't you? Right. You know you've got merch. Just a quick one as well. Obviously, just regarding a little bit part of the film, and you've mentioned this about this in uh, in answering some of the other questions. You mentioned your battle with mental health. Now, yeah. I know that all too well because because it's something that I've suffered with, and I'm very, very open about it, um, you know, to the point now where... I've, I've become a mental health first aider at the company that I work at because especially Brilliant. in a pandemic, more than anything, it's just yeah. so vital, as I'm sure you can agree, just to yeah. say to somebody, like you, like you just said there with, with Jack, how are you doing? Something yeah. as simple as that. It doesn't have to be full cuddles, arms around each other. No, no. Uh, Sometimes big that's overpowering. It is. Just in terms of, obviously, what started it, and you don't have to go into uh, you can go in as much detail as you want. It's your interview. What sort of set it off for you when you realised that I am going through a breakdown, I am going through a crisis, and how did you realise when you were coming through the end of it, that that sort of journey from rock bottom, what got you there, to how you started coming out of it? To be honest, uh, I use the word failings a lot, and uh, I'm quite open about that, and it doesn't bother me. I don't mean it in the in the phrase that I'm saying, but that's how my mind registered it, you know, uh, from, you know, 16 i was tip for top you know everyone had high hopes i had tna on my back i was uh touring with them on the uk tours setting up the rings getting in before the show started with people like the female wrestlers like hamada you know aj styles hernandez we were in there rolling around having fun i was one of the boys you know then i was out in orlando um you know under their their uh training school uh, I was at lockdown when Kurt Angle done the backflip onto uh, Mr. Yes, Anderson. I was right. there and wow. I was tip for top, you know. Um, but one thing led to another and it broke down. So it was a failing. Uh, I then got an opportunity with WWE. My first one failed. Second one failed. Third one failed. Fourth one failed. Just everything just kept getting on top, you know. And then I'm climbing that ladder real quick. And then when people realize, hang on, he's not going to make it, you start dropping again. Um, And obviously, I've I've dedicated a lifetime to this profession. You know, as we've spoken about, I've studied every aspect. There's no bigger dream than making it to the top for me. Uh, And I'm very open and honest about that. Um, But, you know, when that when I just kept failing, then my son was born and I realized I'd moved my wife 230 miles from Gloucester to Norwich. Uh, we had to get a rented house and I had to get two lodges in to pay my rent because I couldn't afford it. I had no money. Um, you know, we're sitting there with blankets with no furniture and I promised this woman the earth. Yeah. I, I just went quick and I got in such a rut with myself, you know, uh, drinking came into play. You know, I was still traveling on the road, but I was still drinking. You know, it, it just got silly, yeah. um, you know, and it, literally it, it all ended with me having a nervous breakdown, you know, the body just shutting down and telling me that's enough, you know, uh, laying in bed uh, and it sounds disgusting. You know, I could go two, three weeks without a shower and anyone that's yeah, suffering yeah. with mental health will understand that. Yeah. You cannot be bothered to even get out of bed. Right. Um, so it was a roller coaster. And fortunately enough, I've got an, an amazing woman that is stuck by me to this day, you know, nine years strong. We're still together and she'll all forever be by my side, no matter what. You know, she, she's my rock, and I, I love her to pieces. Um, but 2017, uh, me and the wife, we actually took a, uh, uh, took some time apart. And the reason for that is the health got so bad that my children didn't want to see daddy like that. Yeah. You know, and I believe that once you've lost everything, you know, my family, they didn't leave me. They just, they needed some time away so that I could fix myself. 
And I've done that. I, I managed to get back up, up, up at it. I watched that movie. I see what was going on. And uh, for me, I've never looked back. Prior to, you know, the, the uh, breakdown, I was on horrendous amount of medication. I was a guinea pig for UK trials to try and help me. They diagnosed me with fibromyalgia, bipolar, you know, uh, anxiety, wow. depression. You yeah. name it, I had every label on me. They were doing tests for ME, MS, cancer. Honestly, I spent 10 days in hospital. They were trying to work out everything. Crikey. But the matter is, I had given up. Yeah. I had just had enough and didn't see what I had to do. Yeah. Watching that movie, coming off all that medication, getting into fitness, losing a, a lot of weight and fighting back was the best thing I've ever done in my life. Um, you know, and going from rock bottom, the only way truly is up. And once you start climbing up, you don't want to slip back down. So yeah. to the point, I am flying high. I've got a beautiful wife. I've got an amazing son, a wonderful daughter with another daughter on the way uh, and a beautiful home. You know, I've got everything that a man can ask for. Do I have a contract coming out of my years for WWE, AEW, any of the big brands? No. But am I now content in life? Yes. And that's what I needed to figure out. Absolutely, Zach. And I think you've just hit the nail on the head there with that last sentence. It's contentment, in it? Once you've got it, because... You, you know, try as you might, you can't buy contentment. But once you've got that, and it, you, like you say, you never want to let go of that. And once you've hit rock bottom, you know what it's like down there. When you've had experience of being down there. And I think from that, what definitely showed in Step Into The Ring as well, is that you definitely, I think from those experiences, it looked to me like you'd done a lot of self-learning from when you hit rock bottom because you were very, very able to manage, and you touched upon this earlier in the interview, to manage how to deal with people. Like you said, with Pocket, you had to show a bit of tough brotherly love with that, yeah. with, with Pocket. With Sam, it was like, ah, come on, mate, put your arm around him. Right then, come on, fella, this is what we can do. And it looked to me that you had had a bit of all of that yourself, that people had to get tough with you, that it yeah. showed that people had to be a bit soft with you, give you a bit of TLC and everything else in between. So that exactly. was epic. Um, Zach, it's been an absolute pleasure, brother. I can't thank you enough for your time this evening. It's been Very absolutely well. immense, especially after um, your biking debacle, what we spoke about off air as well, mate. I'll tell <laughs> you what, to come and uh, have the patience to come and chat with the Pile Driver podcast is immense. So on, on behalf of myself, uh, Gav, and Dale as well. Gav is uh, is one of our NHS heroes. That's why he can't oh, be on wow. tonight, mate. Clap for you so, then, brother. Yeah, fair play. So uh, he's uh, he's on the front line at uh, in Hull Royal Infirmary um, on one of the ICU wards. So that's obviously the reason why he can't be with us tonight. Quick fire round. I'm going to ask you some questions. I want you to just tell me the first word that comes into your head, mate. Okay. Nothing too serious. Nothing too taxing. First things first, your favourite chocolate bar? Chocolate bar? Oh, oh. Milky bar. White chocolate. Favourite wrestler of all time? Shawn Michaels. Best gimmick match of all time? Ooh. Money in the bank. Favourite entrance music from any wrestler? Hulk Hogan. Favourite ring attire? Ooh. I like the tights. Seth Rollins look. AJ Styles look. If you could get yourself in a quintessential historical four-on-four -four Survivor Series match, who would Captain Zach have on his team? Oh, wow. Okay. For me, I'm going to go for the ultimate tech, which is myself, uh, Guerrero, Angle, Michaels. Superb. This year, okay, and you can spend a little bit of time on this one, who do you see reaching really for the stars this year that's currently on the roster in AEW, who can you see being the next champion, uh, the next women's champion, and the next tag champions? Oh, wow. This is AEW? AEW first, then we'll tackle WWE. Okay. I would like, I would really like to see Kip Sabian do more. I really think that he's got the potential to hold a title, whether it be the TNT title, uh, you know, whatever it shall be, I believe his back is strong enough to carry it. Excellent. So um, backing Kip for a singles title. Women's I champion. Think Darby Allen's going to be um, the, the main champion within yes. the next year. Good shout. I've pitched Hangman Page um, to be the first one to kick out of the Falcon Arrow, but 
I could be wrong. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and so we've got Darby Allen. We've got um, we've got uh, Kip to take over from Derby potentially as the TNT champion, women's champion. And who would we see being the next women's champion of AEW? Women's champion. Right, this is where I could embarrass myself, but has Britt Baker been the champion yet? She has not, but that's She's my shout as one. well. That's my shout as well. Fair play, we're on the same page on that one. And the next tag champs. So we've got the Young Bucks currently with their heel face, heel face, heel face turning. Uh, who do we think is going to be the ones to take the belts from the Young Bucks? Ah, uh, to take it from the Young Bucks, I would hope it would be FTR. I think they're an absolutely amazing tag team. Well-oiled, well-craft. Uh, yeah. I believe that they've re-innovated tag team wrestling, not for the, uh, you know, the high-risk manoeuvres, but for the nitty-gritty, you know, quick tag. Uh, I-, I like those two. Fantastic. I've gone for the Lucha Brothers on that one, so one of us one of us is going to be right, I think, on that score. WWE, who is going to be the one to take it from the big dog, the head of the table? Who is going to take the title from Roman Reigns? I'd like to see Kevin Owens take it, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they've been, I mean, that last match at Rumble was absolutely quality, wasn't it? Um, I, the, I the actually really enjoyed there. it. And I'm pr- yeah. brutally honest when it comes to this. I would just tell you outright shit. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> but no, the, the lads, you, bearing in mind, there's not an audience. Yes, yeah. they've got the monitors, but how much of that is dubbed and how much can you hear to put your I body think... on the line and <clears> take them high risk moves? Yeah. Credit to the lads. Who's going to be the next one to take it from uh, the Highland Warrior? Drew McIntyre. Who's going to take his title? I think Edge is going to take it off him. I think Edge is going to take it off him. And if we quickly go with the women's one, who do you think is going to be the next women's champion? So we've got Asuka at the moment. um, And we've obviously got, uh, I believe it's uh, Sasha Sasha at the moment. Sasha Banks. Who's going to be the ones to take it away from those two? Okay, I really want to think about this. Uh, I think Bianca Belair is taking one of them, no problem. Yes, uh, yes. The company is putting that, that, they're putting the company on her back at the moment and she's delivering. Uh, and full credit, she deserves yeah. it. Um, and I can't see past Alexa Bliss not getting another title run with our current storyline at the moment. I believe right. the Fiend's going to come back and I believe they might both take the championships and be the sort of figurehead because they're trying something new with these two and yeah, you either yeah. love it or you don't. I'm the sort of person that's enjoying what they're doing. I absolutely love the Fiend. Uh, I'm not too sure on the Alexa Bliss thing, but I know she's having to hold her own because the Fiend's not on at the moment, but I definitely love the Fiend. I've gone for Charlotte Flair with that one. I can see another heel turn from Charlotte Flair, turn and ask her and gunning for the title. Now they've no longer got the tag titles. Um, Zach, it just leaves me now to ask the penultimate question. The, in fact, no, no, the big question of the interview. Okay. When this pandemic has gone, when we've all been vaccinated, when we're all clear, does the Pal Driver podcast get an invite to WAW? Of course, that goes about saying, it's listen, so I always finish my interviews with the same thing. And that is, well, it depends. If you're a dick, you don't get it. But you, <laughs> you've been an absolute pleasure. So listen, Dave, you and the guys are always welcome down to the Performance Centre. There'll be VIP, uh, VIP tickets waiting for you. But there's oh, one stop. condition. Go for it. I need to meet your boys. Superb. Yeah, if, yeah, if, that's great. That goes without saying. Uh, I'll bring them down. And who knows, Zach, together, we might be able to make a wrestling fan of Mrs. Abbott. Who knows? Well, Do you know you never I mean? know. You never Stranger know. things have happened in the world of wrestling, Zach, <laughs> as you well know. Do you know what I mean? That's an absolute honour. And, uh, and another little question as well that's come in from Gav is, would you be prepared at some point to put us through a little wrestling boot camp as well? So How about sure, this? You go for it. How about once the pandemic's done, you guys come and travel to Norwich early. Yeah. Uh, I will get you in the ring an hour or two before the show. I'll yes. show you what it's really like to bump round in a professional wrestling <laughs> ring and run cable ropes, uh, yes. which sounds strange saying that, cable ropes. Um, <laughs> but listen, I will give you an hour of my time, which people pay a lot of money for. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I will give you free entry to my show to enjoy. The only thing that I ask is you guys do a podcast about your experience as honest as possible. If 100%. there's parts you don't like, you tell it straight. But I want 100%. an honest opinion after a day at the PC with the Knight family. 
it would be an absolute pleasure on behalf of all of us and our and our families as well. Zach, I'm going to leave you in peace because I know you've done a lot of miles on your bike. I know you've had issues with your bike as well. I know your mates are fed up with their bikes as well. And I know <laughs> that uh, your missus and your kids will be needing you just like my family will be needing me right now. So listen, brother, it's been an absolute pleasure. God bless you. Thank you very, very, very much for your time. Um, and we're going to get all this edited stuff, mate. And uh, before it goes out there, we'll send you the edit. Let us know what you think. You're very welcome, mate. And I'll share it on my socials and try and get some more views and stuff for you. I'm really sorry about how many times we put it back, but I do so many of these. It comes yeah. to a stage where I'm like, uh, the wife go, no more, <laughs> no more. You know, you interrupt, the kids go to bed. Um oh, you know, so in, in a pandemic, it's very difficult. But I appreciate your patience. I Not appreciate so. how respectful you've been. And, uh, you know, good luck with this podcast. I really hope that it just soars so to new heights. Body. No, I appreciate it. And uh, give our love to the family as well. Um, obviously, I know Paige is out on her own, isn't she, in America? So she I is. would imagine she's finding it quite tough as well. Um, just speaking to you guys on FaceTime and Skype, no doubt, and obviously yeah. Zoom as well. So give our love to your mum and dad and uh, your brothers, all the rest of the family as well. And uh, when you. all this lifts, buddy, uh, we'll be in touch again and uh, we'll definitely come down to WAW. Stay in contact. you got my email address, mate. Look after yourself. Love to everyone. And I can't wait to meet your boys. They sound oh, special. So I appreciate it, mate. God bless you. Take care, Zach. Take all the care, best, mate. Dude. And this has been the Pal...